There we go. Yeah. Um, um, uh, on, this, on this religion, stay with us for a few minutes. Kate, I'll ask your question again. <laughs> okay. Um, so I asked him right at the beginning of the break. Um, I was just curious because I know that in Japan, for example, there's not really, they don't have a sense of religion, so shall we say, um, and many are what they consider non-religious, but they still do the, the yearly rituals that they've had from the past, and I was wondering if it had been the same for, for China today, do they consider themselves religious in the sense that they still do all of the rituals that they have every year? For a lot of Chinese, but for East Asians overall, um, they do associate, just as we do, we tend to say religion means Christianity. And if you have a little room in your head left over, you can bring in some Judaism and Islam as well, to make it Abrahamic. It overwhelmingly means <coughs> the creator God, it means the immortal soul, pie in the sky when you die, to, to, to quote the atheists, that kind of thing. Um, and that is the kind of basic meaning of religion. Spirituality can be New Age, or it can be this, that, or spiritualism, which is even worse. People kind of run shy of that. But if you think of religion as something that is kind of basic to the human condition, there is something that passes for religion in every culture. It's too common to just wish off to the side. That is something basic, if you will, to the human condition and will find different ways of being expressed. And if you change the way you syllabicate the world and you go from atonement, meaning you want to get rid of your guilt, to make it at one minute, where you want to feel like you belong, I am, Wittgenstein put it, for him the ethical and the religious are the same. They are the sense that we are absolutely safe. Nothing can harm me. That was how Wittgenstein defined the religious and the ethical. And that, now that has a Christian tone to it, we are safe in God's hands. But if you can kind of keep in mind no place in the world is sacred unless some human beings make it so. There are no sacred places apart from human beings saying this is a sacred place. That's what makes it sacred. We make it sacred. A book that I heartily commend to your attention <coughs> if you haven't read it yet is Herbert Fingerud's Confucius, The Secular is Sacred. That's what he has done to sacralize the secular. Um, I wrote about that a little bit in another little book that I did, uh, the Rationality <coughs> and Religious Experience. If you, religious experience for some people, and uh, I am one of them, different, you can have different kinds of religious experiences. One is the mystical trance, <coughs> and that seems to be the same the world over in terms of being described, interpreted very differently, very differently. By an amazing coincidence, no Buddhist mystic has ever said he's had union with God, and no Christian mystic has ever announced um, awareness of the void, shunyata. You interpret the experience according to the cultural heritage from whence you come. <coughs> but the descriptions of mystical experiences tend to be uniform the world over. <coughs> There's a saying, that's one kind of religious experience. A second kind is visions and voices. Some places become sacred to some people because Our Lady of Fatima was here or the miracles of Lourdes. They become pilgrimage sites. But they, are, they take on a sacred status because God or the angels or something supposedly visited that place. And there's a third set of religious experiences, the ones that I focus on, which are designed or which bring about a sense of belonging. A 
belonging or attunement. You're attuned to this. It is not a different kind. It's not. It's something that's added to our ordinary experience. It's not a different experience. Radical. It's a different way of experiencing what you normally experience. Again, the example I consistently use with my students, have you, is, I hope, I'm giving you a lot of these personal anecdotes so you can pass them on to yours as you find them useful to your own students. Uh, you, you, after 10 years after graduation, you go back to your alma mater with a couple of your friends who have never been there before. You will all see the same thing, you will hear the same things, <clears throat> but you'll experience them differently. You belong there, they don't. Okay? It's that kind of thing, like coming home again. You know? Even though Elliot says we can't do it. A sense of belonging, or as Wittgenstein put it in Christian terms, <coughs> a sense of being safe. A sense of belonging, of being at one with God, if you were a Christian. Of being at <coughs> one with all of the chosen people, if you are a Hebrew. At one with Allah, if you are a Muslim. At one with the infinity of the transitory universe, if you are a Buddhist. At one with the unity of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, the creative force, the sustaining force, and destructive force of the universe. At one with nature, if you're a Taoist, with the natural world, the rhythms of the day and the night and the seasons. At one with the human race, if you're confusion. So any man's death diminishes me. That can be cultivated, and that's the kind of experience every religious tradition has ways, disciplines, to get that experience out of you, so you can have that sense of belonging. It's easily lost sight of in Christianity, because there is so much time spent on God's realm, and what God wants and the life of Jesus as our Savior. And so it's hard to see the other, there are two ways of looking at this, from Rudolf Otto's ways of, God is guns under us. God is holy other. <coughs> holy other. Of course, that's very spooky, it can be. It tends to dominate. But there is another lesser, but not altogether uncommon, God is mit uns. God is with us. God is in our midst. And it's that sense that can be cultivated. You can't, you can't guarantee to have experience. The same way you can't be guaranteed to have mystical experience, no matter how much time you spend in meditation. You can learn to quiet yourself down, get the alpha waves down, all kinds of things, but you're not guaranteed a mystical experience. But all of them, the disciplines, involves ego reduction. To get the ego out of the way so the spirit can come out and get that sense of belonging if it works. That's what they all have. Every religion has to participate in ritual. What do you do with rituals? You submit. I will move my body just like they tell me to. I will say exactly the words I am told to say. That's what it means to perform a ritual. You have to be at least semi-egoist to perform a ritual in the right way. There are other ways, well, take, um, some of you obviously has, Catholicism is one of the examples I use in the little book. Most Catholics engage in just following the rituals and the customs of the church. Used to be when I was young, you had to eat fish on Friday. You couldn't eat any meat on Friday. <coughs> so stop that, but that was part of it. You were supposed to go to mass on Sunday. You were supposed to go to confession at least once a week. You're supposed to give up something for Lent. You followed the rituals, the customs, and the traditions of the church. You were working people, but that's the way you tried to get a sense of belonging, of reducing your ego. <coughs> or 
Or you could be like the Christian philosopher, like Gabriel Marcel, uh, or Hans Kuhn more recently. That is, you can make a life study of being a scholar. You can, a scholar is simply one who writes scholia in the margin of the sacred books. Uh, you can absorb yourself in the texts and in the history of the religion and become egoist that way. Uh, there are, again, a lot of examples of that. Probably Thomas Merton is the most famous of the, the last two generations of that. Or you can be an activist, or it, it would be the path of karma yoga in the, for the Hindus and the Buddhists. It would be like Dorothy Day and the Catholic worker for the Catholics. You give your life to the betterment, to overcoming poverty and evil and mischief. Um, or you can become a monk or a nun. It, it combines a lot of the other. There are a number of ways, and every religion has ways of doing that in this world. It's one of the reasons it looks like the good book contradicts itself. It's because the good book is giving different instructions to different people. And again, the more you learn about the Analects, the better you'll be able to read the Bible, I can promise you. <laughs> you may not have any interest in the Bible, <laughs> but you will certainly also read the Bible, the New Testament, and the Hebrew Scriptures, and the Surahs of the Quran differently after you come to terms with the analytics. And that's why I would say I want to be your friend uh, in that way, because it can really do a lot to open up different ways of being in the world and looking at the world mm -hmm. and thinking about the world uh, for you in, in those ways. Um, so when you think of religion that way, and you can make it very concrete he says, what is one of the most common rituals within the church? And how culture-bound the interpretation of religion can be. There is a story, I'll, I'll give you the, the ritual, but first I'll give you the story of a group of um, Catholic missionaries were meeting in China to discuss the problem. This is back in the 1920s. And there was uniform admission that, that, that Christianizing was not going well. It was working only temporarily in places of famine. <coughs> they could baptize people who then promptly forgot it as soon as the next crop came in. But they were also, and they were curious as to why they were being so unsuccessful. And <coughs> one, <coughs> they had a few Chinese there with them, one of whom was not, had not become a Christian himself. He was one of the very first Chinese to go to, uh, to Harvard. And he got up and gave one of the sh shortest speeches, uh, I guess, ever on any remotely resembling that subject. He said, gentlemen, I, I have it almost memorized, it's that short. Gentlemen, you have all lived in China to know that we are a people who deeply respect the family, and even most deeply the father who is the head of the family. And you must keep that in mind when you think of a belief system in which a father sees to the killing of his only son to atone for the sins of a world that he created himself <laughs> and to celebrate the murder in a feast that smacks of cannibalism is not very appetizing to a civilized people. And accustomed to it. <laughs> oh, and accustomed to it. He said, ah, oh, the last sentence always catches me. Civilized people unaccustomed to it. No understatement of the, the decade. <laughs> Cannibalism. They smoke. This is my body. This is my blood. What could that possibly mean? Um, this is my, what is the body? It's a wafer. It's a piece of meat. It is grown from something that looked just like a little rock. But it went into the earth, and it grew, and it produces something that human beings can transform, and it keeps them alive. That's religious. This is my blood, the grape. Both things of this earth. Feeling God is right here right here, 
And now, okay, Sunday, I can feel it now. Now, of course, not many Catholics feel it anymore. Mm. They don't feel it. This is what I have to do on Sunday morning. The meaning of it is no longer there. But it is, there is a way that it is all this worldly. Every religious tradition that I know of has ways of telling its adherents to find a sense of comfort, contentment, belonging in this world here and now. Not just the pie in the sky when you die. Not just fear you're not being a good girl, a good boy, but here's how you can lead a, learn how to truly enjoy the joyous things in life and learn how to come to terms with the grief and the sorrow that you will have to endure because that's what it means to lead a human life, is to have sorrow as well as joy. Here now. Um, and you will, as I say, that, thank you so much, Carlos. Very kind. Uh, so you, you have to invest the rituals with the meaning. Other than that, they're just meaningless. Otherwise, um, again, that's what Confucius when he said, you know, if you just feed your parents, what's that? If the reverence, the respect is there, how can you call that being filial? You have to put yourself into it. Um, okay, let's do. Did any of the analects that you memorized? speak to things that we talked about this morning? Uh, if so, let's just start going around the room with some of those. And then I also, I really want to hear your own analects. <laughs> um, and also, uh, an analect that you found absolutely opaque, <laughs> or wrong, uh, or, or both, knowing kind of rehash. Who would like to um, give me their memorized analect? So I, I use one that's um, actually the translation is a little bit different from the one that I have in my um, PowerPoint. But one of the things I had worked on um, not too long ago with the East West Center was something getting at sort of different views of filial piety between Confucianism and Buddhism and Taoism, um, and um, and doing a little PowerPoint on that. And so one of you know there's lots of different analects that are about that. So I wouldn't say this is my favorite one, but uh, but I'll say it anyway, because um, it's, it's in there. I, it's become less of my favorite the more I've had to memorize it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if some of the rest of you experienced that, but uh, um, so this is from the um, uh, your translation, which is, I should say, kind of in, different, a little bit interesting in it being more, in some ways, more grammatically uh, uh, well, you hear it. <laughs> I don't know it's kind of more more grammatically um, uh, complicated. So, and it's uh, what is it one one point one one? And said, what is it? Uh, the master says, uh, while a person's father is alive, observe what he intends. When his father dies, observe what he does. Um, the person who for three years, uh, what is it, who for three years refrains from reforming the ways of his late father will be called a filial son. I think that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Come on, check, yeah. So, um, <coughs> again, just having to do with what does it mean to be filial? <coughs> what are one's duties and responsibilities. Um, Turn to uh, page 379. Which page? Did you say 379 or 279? I'm going to 279. Oh, okay. <laughs> In the middle of the second paragraph there, the eventful, dynamic, and relational reading we give to early Chinese thought and the language in which it is written is regularly reflected in our translation. 
Most other translators of the Analects have assumed a more essentialistic and conservative Confucius, more concerned with constancy than with change. Yeah. Both views are clearly in evidence when translations are compared. Consider the concluding section of 111, first by leg. If for three years he does not alter from the ways of his father, he may be called filial. Then Arthur Whaley, if for the whole three years of mourning he manages to carry on the household exactly as in his father's days, he is a good son indeed. Raymond Dawson, that's the Oxford University right. Press translation, if for three years he makes no change from the ways of his father, he may be called filial. And finally, D.C. Lau, who was, was Roger's teacher, <laughs> if for three years he takes no changes to his father's ways, he can be said to be a good son. And right. there's our version. A person who for three years refrains from reforming the ways of his father may be called a filial son. Now, what we meant by that being more grammatically complicated is it clearly suggests that you can change the ways of your father. Mm -hmm. You must give them a go <coughs> for three years, which actually meant tw about 27 months. And the so-called three years of mourning was two years and, and a season uh, for the most part, between 26 and 27 months uh, of mourning, whether that is. But it's clear from Leg, Whaley, Dawson, and Lau. The, the text itself is ambiguous as we go on there, the word guy uh, on the next page. Philology will not entirely settle the matter. I'm at the top of 281 now. For guy has been conventionally rendered as to change, to alter, to correct, to amend, or to reform. And the negative who can thus equally be linked to guy as does not alter, makes no change, refrains from reforming. You, you have... All of those are within the semantic range, and all of which are grammatical in both Chinese and English. So which one you choose is a function of how you interpret the text. It's another hobby horse of Rogers and mine. There are no translations without interpretations. You have to inter interpret in order to translate. So the, uh, we read thoroughly, and we asked a number of other people, do the other translations suggest that he's never going to change the ways of his father in a different way than ours does? Do you get the same certainty? And the, the poll was pretty clear. Refrains from reforming for three years, meaning he may want to reform, but he's not going to do it until he's given his father's ways their best shot, so to speak. By which time he might come to see, oh, all right, now I see why he did it that way. And I, I guess I'll keep it up. He doesn't have to. But the others all do assume that's it. The, the function of the son is to be exactly like the father. Which and and, give you a and some problem. of the translations where, like at the, for example, at the beginning, you know, where some will say more explicitly, um, uh, what is it, um, when a person's father is alive, Observe what his son intends. Let's say so that, as as opposed to observe what he intends. I mean, I kind of took it as he meaning the person, but again, the grammatically, grammatically, it made me say, are, "Is the he referring to the father?" That was one of those places where I was saying, "Who's the he we're talking?" You know, who whose intentions are we looking at? Should the son be looking at how his father is intending to act, or is the son looking? Are we looking at the son's intention? So I decided it was, you know, the son, but um, yeah, no, if that was an example. Is, yeah, look, 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 what the, how, look how the son is responding to his father. Yeah. Uh, is, is what it is. But there, and, and of course, Whaley and uh, the leg and so on have a large number of Chinese themselves, I guess, throughout history have taken analects like that to say, you know, you don't ever change the ways of your father. Just like... Right. Never, always obey your father, always obey. Whereas there's clear statements about, that, well, too, look in the, in the book, The Shenzhen, the classic of family reverence, chapter 15, I commend to your attention, specifically that one. Tzulu asks, uh, Zengza asks, if 
the sign you are then a good filial son if you never disobey your father? And his master comes as close to say, you didn't, haven't you understood anything I said? <laughs> if you can't have anyone to remonstrate with you when you're wrong, you can't be a good father. You can't be a good ruler. If you don't have ministers who will remonstrate with you. You have to. The only the truly filial son is the one who challenges the father when he doesn't think the father's doing the right thing. He does it in a respectful way. Yeah. But um, he still has to do the challenging. The um, other striking things, which we have as long as we're on that, you'll notice, and especially women who have taught the Anglix, uh, have thanked us for getting rid of the sexism and the pronouns and everything uh, we've there. And of course, everybody, our colleagues will say, well, you know they're all sexist. And I say, well, maybe not. It wasn't really until the Tang Dynasty that the debate was settled against women being able to obtain sagehoods. And even while Confucius was still alive, the Mohists were complaining that he allowed women into the rituals and therefore was ruining the distinction between men and women. But equally important, the grammar was on our side. Chinese words are not marked for gender, they're not marked for case, they're not marked for number. So every time Junza, you can say the gentleman, he, or you can say, which is better because there aren't any, we don't use the word gentleman in the U.S. except in the front of men's rooms in the, in the <laughs> restaurants. Uh, exemplary person is they, brings everybody in and is uh, gender neutral. And the text reads differently. We have the, certainly the grammar on our side and maybe the historical evidence. Now, the Chinese became very patriarchal, undeniable later on, and books like this one were cited chapter and verse on behalf of the patriarchy and the subservience of the mother and of the daughters and of the, of the sons and everybody to the unquestioned patriarch all the time. So the, one of the questions for the Chinese today is, why did that come up? How is it that that construal became the norm? And so thereby obscuring the message that might otherwise be read, easily read out, which is what Roger and I tried to read out of the, the text. Uh, <coughs> but notice that even however the philological and grammatical arguments, what is central when we talk about family is the intergenerationality. If Confucius was homophobic, well, that's kind of his problem or his shade's problem. The idea of a family, though, can be just as rich as he thought it was, and maybe even richer, by having two or even more nurturers of the same sex, the same gender uh, there. What's important is intergenerationality. That's what's important. There is nothing the Christian right who complains about the breakdown of the family, nothing stupider than opposing gay marriage, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and that there's so many gays who want to have families and will be loving families, obviously. Uh, again. And so I think you see there's nothing, what you have is benefactor, beneficiary. You can have everything negotiated. What it would mean, marriages in the future, there'd be more discussion of, okay, how much of a traditional mother should each of us be? How much of a traditional father should each of us be? How can we negotiate what's the best way to get on, or should we just wing it uh, for a while till we see how it falls out? Kind of things like that. And you could have it at larger groups too. You see the sociology, the psychology, the politics, all kind of, as they intermingle in there. Um, the more that you have gays especially, but not just gays, adopting children, the fewer orphanages there are going to be obviously, and the more families are able to be subsidized by having parents and grandparents, the less we will need those places you go to die. They call them assisted living now. They're really hospices for most people. They don't live very long after going into a nursing home. Mm -hmm. Crushed is the spirit. Crushed is the spirit. So are, are there other ways to, uh, other terms 
for uh, for something like piety, or you know, when you look in that and you hear in that language, at least to my ear, you know, ancestors.